great to be here. Uh, and uh, when uh, Daniela asked me if I would uh, be willing to present my paper with Chuck Dara in a plenary session, of course, I was deeply honored to do so. Uh, and also uh, thought, well, it's probably because she didn't know where to put this paper in the program. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but I hope I will engage all of you in a conversation that I hope will go on beyond uh, the presentation today. So my, uh, the paper that I have authored with Chuck Dara, uh, who's a professor of anthropology at San Jose State University, is on looking at what are the possibilities for an anthropology of services. So how did we come to, uh, Chuck and I, to explore the question of what might be the benefits of an anthropology of service? And what happened with me is about 12 years ago, I joined a research group at IBM Research uh, called the Services Research Group. And I had spent most of my career as an anthropologist working in innovation in technology and, and products at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. So it was one of the uh, early social scientists who was looking at ways that we could bring social science perspectives into innovation and technology. But when I joined IBM Research, we had a particular design brief, which was what would a, service of, a, re, a science of service look like? How could we develop a, a research program that would connect with IBM's services division, which at the time was over half of IBM's business? And the idea behind the group was to rebalance the, the investment that IBM was making in research, where at the time, most of the research was in uh, products. So we were asking, what did it mean to focus on research and service? What, in what ways were the research questions for services different than those for products? And in what ways was innovation in services different than innovation in products? And for me, it was where might an anthropology of services connect with this developing and emerging research agenda? And if you see on this slide uh, in the upper left-hand corner, that's a, an aerial view of the uh, research center where I work in San Jose, California, the Almaden Research Center. And underneath is Jim Spohr, who many of you know and has been a very active participant in developing uh, the area of service research uh, globally. And so he was um, a partner, uh, I was a partner with him, as we began to explore what a research agenda on services might look like in the IBM context. And at the same time, my co-author, Chuck Dara, who is on the right here, um, was beginning to develop uh, a master's degree in applied anthropology at San Jose State University. And he realized that the graduates of this program would enter a world where services dominated the economic activity and also the employment opportunity for the students who would come out with master's degrees in applied anthropology. And he also realized that they would most likely be providing services for others and would be hired into companies, to government agencies and to nonprofits to design services uh, for their customers and for their constituents. So we began, and I'd known Chuck for many years, and we began to talk about how services were being conceptualized in the service literature and what the possible benefits might be uh, if we were to focus an anthropological lens on our understanding of services and the opportunity to bring about change. So one of the thing, first things that we observed was that um, that, there, that there were services long before there was a service economy. In fact, we observed that services were essential for people just getting on in the world. From, as you look at this slide here, from the services of shaman and other healers um, that were provided many, many centuries ago, to the boat making and navigation services of the Trobriand Islanders, to the services that communities have long provided in barn raising ceremonies and other kinds of community uh, activities that support people working together. And also to the entertainment services. Of, in this image here, you see um, the services that are 
provided here. This is, happens to be a donkey-drawn carriage rides that were provided in, Mel in the Melbourne Zoo. So as we looked around, we realized that services were an essential part of how people got on in the world. And yet, as we looked around, we were also being told that we needed to pay attention to a transformation and a shift that was occurring. Whereas, as, and again, the slide in the lower right-hand corner here um, shows one that many of you have probably seen before, which is the transition that's happened in terms of where the economy has gone over the years from one that's been dominated by agriculture to one uh, dominated by manufacturing and goods, and now one where increasingly uh, services are playing an important role. So the question for us was, you know, what's the, what are we hearing today about the importance of services and what does that mean in relationship to the fact that we know that services ha have been a lo around long before there was a service economy uh, and that they in fact are critical and essential to the way in which humans get on in the world. The other thing we observed was that change is ubiquitous and ongoing. So people have always been tinkering with their own lives. So as we looked at the anthropological record, it was clear that things don't stay still. So just looking at the role of the family in um, Western societies, we observed that there was a shift that had gone on over many uh, decades. For example, if you look again at the images on this slide, um, if we look at just meal preparation, uh, from the extended families who gathered around the dinner table in the 1800s, to the TV dinners of the 1950s, to the explosion of fast food restaurants in the 1980s. And finally, to the gourmet meal services of today. I know I live in Silicon Valley and there are many families who are taking advantage of meals that are, develop, are delivered to their home prepared by gourmet cooks. Um, so how families secure food has changed and will continue to change. So the particular socio-material arrangements do not stay the same. And as we think about our understanding of services in the context of this uh, service economy, I think we need to also be aware of the fact that things are, have always been changing. Uh, and, and, that, and that services are reconfiguring divisions of labor. So things have been changing, and as part of that, we see that services uh, over time have reconfigured the relationship between humans and humans, and between humans and machines and capital. If you again look at uh, just some changes that have happened in our lifetimes around self-service technologies, like banking and airline check-in, um, and also, as we look even more contemporary, contemporaneously, the peer-to-peer -peer services like Airbnb and Lyft car services. So Airbnb where people are providing these peer-to-peer -peer services where people are providing uh, access to rooms in their homes as hotel uh, stay for, for travelers, or Lyft where people are providing rides using their car uh, to people who need to get from one place to another. And these changes can be quite disruptive. So as we know, what happened to bank tellers and airline counter staff as we moved more and more to uh, self-service technologies? And how about those hotel chains and uh, the, the, the stockholders and the businesses? Uh, what happens as we move more and more to peer-to-peer uh, -peer kinds of, of uh, ways of delivering um, uh, services? And of course, the taxi drivers and the insurance companies and the automobile dealers are being affected by the changes in uh, these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, taxi services. So change is ubiquitous, and, but also not without its politics and its consequences. So Chuck and I also began then to look around at what are, what are some of the service concepts that are being used to describe uh, this, the services that we, we uh, recognized today. Um, and what we observed was that these concepts were very alluring to anthropologists. Concepts like service encounter, touch point, co-production, value co-creation, and service system. As we 
read about these, these notions, ways of describing services, we saw that they were very suggestive of things that were quite familiar to us, trained as anthropologists, interaction, performance, enactment, mutually constitutive, holism. These concepts shared some similarities, a focus on what people did together, uh, uh, yeah, focus on the fact that, that, that the outcomes of our interactions um, were produced during and through those interactions. The fact that we needed to understand the relationship between parts of the system, not just the individual entities within it. Um, so these, we thought that there was something very exciting going on as people were developing a research agenda around services. <coughs> At the same time, <coughs> excuse me, we, um, we felt that there were some things that were being left out, unexplored, things that were critical about our understanding of the human condition. So as you think about uh, um, service encounters and touch points, the encounters are much more about, are more than about just the people who are the immediate uh, actors in those encounters. They're also about the individuals and members of communities whose values and ways of doing things are actively influenced uh, in the service encounter. So we need to look beyond the individual focus to the ways in which those individuals who are, in, having in, are part of a service encounter are um, the, the folks that they interact with and develop their understandings, their values, their, their belief systems. So services perform larger social functions beyond the immediate individual benefit that is gained. If we look at notions of co-production and co creation, we observe that the co in co-production and co-creation often conceals complexities in the provider-recipient relations, including the unequal character of some of these partnerships. For example, in this conference, we've heard a lot about um, services for elders, for elder care. But what is the power dynamic between elder people and the government agencies who provide those services? Are they equal partners in the creation of value? And do they have equal say in how the services are produced? These are questions that we think are important for us to address as we use the concepts of co-production and co-creation to understand what are some of the complexities in those, those co-relationships that we um, so often um, refer to. And then the notion of service systems. What we find in the literature is that descriptions of service systems often suggest that they are entities with agency waiting to be discovered, that they're naturalized, they exist in the world. In fact, here's a quote from Avargo et al, 2008, um, where they say, service systems engage in exchange with other service systems to enhance adaptability and survivability this co-creating value for themselves and others. So here you see in that quote that, that service systems are given a kind of agency to act in the world. But where do these service systems come from? Where do they get their agency? What training do you need to see them? Well, there's some comfort in the notion of a service system in, an, in that it suggests that the service can be the object of scientific inquiry and, and, and can be engineered. However, the service metaphor breaks down when it fails to acknowledge the emergent quality of social life. Because services like life in, more generally are open and fragmentary, the ability to specify design requirements and directly tie those requirements to desired outcomes is always imperfect. So people have always lived in service worlds, as I mentioned, and these worlds are far messier than the concepts that we use to import, impose an order on them. People have lived in, in, in service worlds that are simul simultaneously material and immaterial, and they have always been engaging each other to create things, ideas, and interactions. It is only recently that we have 
what, that the things we make and do together have been framed as goods and services. For example, a nomadic hunter living in the desert of southern Africa plays a flute crafted by his uncle to entertain families gathered around a campfire after a successful hunt. This scene could be described as constituted by services, the uncle who designed and built the flute, the musician who performed under the evening sky, the service of the hunters who killed and butchered the game. Or the, the scene could be described in terms of goods, the goods that were exchanged, the flute, perhaps given to the nephew at a key juncture in his life, the meat allocated according to long-standing rules. The human past reminds us that he, the human experience and the meanings we derive from our interactions with each other and with the things depend on specific socio-material arrangements. It makes no sense to unbundle services from goods or from the specific locale in which they are enacted. So what might this say about, these issues say about an anthropology of services? What do they teach us? So an anthropology of services depicts life and how it might be different. An anthropology of services shows how ordinary people design in ways that are ubiquitous and yet unrecognized. An anthropology of services recognizes how designers themselves enact the activities they believe constitute design. And it reflects on what else designers are doing to realize and manage their contributions to service worlds. An anthropology of services appreciates that services have always been more than the monetized variants we hear so much about today. And it acknowledges that the costs and benefits of adopting new services are borne differently by different members of society. Given that, what are the implications for service design? What can we take away from some of these observations for the work that we are all engaged in in service design? And many of these issues I think I've been hearing about throughout the conference. So maybe I'm bringing um, uh, or just reflecting on things that all of you have been reflecting on as well. But there are limits to our efforts to design services given that services are embedded in particular socio-material contexts. Service design is fundamentally about designers' relationships with people, both real and imagined, past and present. I noted in Pele's talk um, the other morning, yesterday morning, that he talked about how important it was that the people they were working with liked them, it could engage with them, found uh, the interactions valuable. Service designers must also locate themselves in relation to the entities that they and others assemble to provide services. And also, the implications for service design are that change is ongoing, and designers must design for the time when they are no longer active participants in enacting the service or being accountable for their outcomes. People are tinkering with their own lives. Change is ubiquitous. Designers step in at a moment in time and help to, to direct and, and, and um, influence that change. But there will, will be a time when they are not there any longer. And what, how, have, what have, they, how have they left the scene such that this change that will continue uh, continues to have the impact of their, their activities? And finally, service design is both ethical and political, and designers can't ignore the consequences of their design choices. So, thank you. <laughs>